Hi everyone at the one ring.net green dragon here aka Kirsten and I am thrilled to be joined today by none other than Bear McCreary composer for the Rings of Power. Hi Bear. Hi Kirsten. Hi gang. How's it going? It's great to see you. Thanks for spending this time with us and exploring your score. How are you feeling? The show's all out there now and you know your score has, I would say, been one of the highlights for many people of the show. So you must be feeling pretty good about that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I do. I, I feel really good. And um, the response has been great. And I, I'm, I'm proud of the work that I did. And I, I feel like it's everything I wanted it to be, which, which means it, it allows me to really just enjoy the the response and and kind of kick back and and for people that loved it I, I i i can take a lot of pride in that and anybody that didn't like it i can say well that's my fault because i wrote it i'm proud of it you know so i'm sorry you didn't like it not really um but yeah no it's been great i mean it's what a whirlwind um just 15 months ago uh more or less um i was hired on this thing and uh here we are you know, now it's out right. there. Right, right. I was going to ask you about that, actually, because uh, it seems to me of necessity, your work on a show like this has to be done really late in the day. You know, you, you can start working <laughs> on your themes, your motifs, but then actually scoring the episodes, that is a pretty down to the wire kind of a thing. So you're you're one of the last pieces to be added, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 sound music and vfx and uh and music is the one that i think is the most vulnerable to last minute changes mm -hmm. um if an effect shot changes um i mean it's a tremendous amount of work i don't mean to compare the vfx teams are incredible but if if a cut changes and you you know the music music is all about the flow across the whole thing it's i sometimes i once had a a director assure me on a big action scene. It's like, look, well, we're still making changes, but it's just, it's just gonna be little nips and it's little frames here and there, frames here and there. And I finally had to tell him, I would rather you cut the entire scene out of the movie than continue to cut frames yeah. out of a thing that I have created this paced experience. Um, so yeah, it is very, once it is at the last stage uh, is really when music can begin and, um, yeah, it, it 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 was a that made it a challenge. I mean, it was it was a heightened challenge because I didn't even really have that much time to do the themes either. Mm. Um, I I I think that uh, speaking for the showrunners on their behalf, I think they would be the first to tell you that um, COVID created a lot of problems during production. Not the least of which was anything that was not an emergency got kicked down the line. Like I, I started speaking with them in 2019. I almost flew out to New Zealand to meet with them. And then I didn't hear from them again hmm. for two and a half years wow. uh, because COVID hit. And obviously that decision to hire a composer was not the most pressing thing anymore. Um, so yeah, it, it, I, I had to, even writing the themes I did in a, in a, four to six week period um, in last summer that was intense to say the least. It was, it was, that was the most brutal part of the experience for me. I, I'm sure because you had to come up with a lot of motifs for this show. I mean, that's kind of mind blowing. How do you even begin to come up with all of those <laughs> disparate themes? Yeah, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> I didn't make it easy on myself. Um, I, I came up with a list of 15 themes when I read the scripts, and I thought that was absurd, absurdly high for my experience in television, but it actually ended up not being sufficiently high. I, I, depending on your count, it came up to about 17 themes that the show required. And um, I also wanted to make sure that they really had um, legs for a long journey. So while many themes, as many of our favorite themes can be very short, they're almost what I would call like motivic ideas or, or motives, uh, like um, 
Duel of the Fates. Bum, bum, ba, da, dum, bum, bum, ba, da, dum. Yeah. That's it. It's this. That's the idea. It's a great idea. Very Prokofiev inspired. Yep. Um, but also, I mean, looking at John Williams, you know, and, and James Horner would do this. Jerry Goldsmith would do this. Basil Polidorus would do this. Themes had were like songs or um, arias from an opera where the theme itself had an, had an intro idea, mm -hmm. uh, had a melody, an A melody, a B mm -hmm. melody, maybe another version of the melody that told you something else about the character and then an ending that told you something about the character's ending arc. I, I challenged myself to write a piece of music, not just a theme, but a piece of functional music, symphonic music for every realm and every character in that language. And mm -hmm. I knew that if I did, I would have all, all the pieces I would need. I would have more pieces than I would need in the first season. So that was, um, that was a lot, but, uh, but I got through it. I, I feel like I did it. And, and on the first season soundtrack, um, there are, I believe, 14 tracks that are on that record that actually originate from that writing period. Um, okay. That were a combination of the theme idea that I wrote in the beginning, along with a cue quotation from the body of the show. But technically, there are 14 tracks that don't appear in a literal form in, mm -hmm. in the first season. Um, but I thought that was cool. And I thought if any fandom would appreciate that kind of roadmap into the world, um, it would be uh, it would be Lord of the Rings fans who I right. consider myself a member of. So I thought uh, I don't know. So let me turn to you guys. What what did you think? Was that did did you pick up on that? Oh, totally. And you know, I think because we were so um, spoiled in a way with with Howard Shaw's work and with all of the live work that has grown out of that, the Lord of the Rings symphony that was put together, and then the screenings of the movies with live orchestra, etc. Um, I think we have kind of almost come to expect it. And so there'll be a sense now like, okay, when do we get the Rings of Power symphony that we can go and hear in concert halls, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's something that the fans definitely want and have been fortunate enough to have in the past. And so I think that was definitely the right approach because we want these soundtracks that that live on their own, that live as pieces of symphonic music. I, I agree, that's how I feel about it. And I, I think of the music almost as its own journey into Middle Earth that you can take with the footage or without it. Um, and I wanted to, uh, you know, referring specifically to, to, to How Howard Shore's uh, scores um, for the Peter Jackson films, and I wanted to, I wanted to do something that, that, that could operate on that level. Um, but I also just knew that for me as a fan, that's what I wanted to hear, you yeah. know, like I, I, I really felt that, uh, the, the, the most pressure that I was under was, um, living up to my own expectations. Well, and it's, it feels to me, and, and you can tell me if you would agree with this, or but it feels to me that particularly for Tolkien, music is a very important way in. Um, you know, his, his writing is full of songs and he may not have written the music for them, but, but all these characters have songs. They burst into song a lot. And in, you know, in the Silmarillion, the very world is created through music. And so Tolkien obviously felt that music was an important way into creation, into a world. Um, and so even though your music is coming towards the end of the creative process for the TV show, it, it surely is a profound jumping off point for us all for, for getting into Tolkien's realm. Uh, I, I appreciate that and, and I, I agree. I mean, I, I remember in the, even when I was a kid, the opening chapter of The Hobbit that it's, he writes even what instruments the dwarves played on. And, um, and um, uh, I recall, even I think even in the animated version that it was, they had some of them, if not exactly. But it was a level of detail that even when I was a kid, I, I thought, wow, these, dwarf, these dwarven warriors are carrying these instruments with them. That's how important yeah. music is to the world to them. And, um, 
and I, I definitely wanted to, to create music that felt in world, meaning when you're hearing the score for the Harfoots, it feels like music that they might be making. Yes, it has orchestral trappings that help tell the story, but at its foundation, there's wooden percussion instruments. In this case, it's balafons and log drums. And then early Celtic instruments, uh, small Scottish bagpipes and penny whistle that just feel like it could be instruments they have. Yeah. Uh, the same thing with Numenor and their um, Middle Eastern uh, frame drums. And uh, obviously with the dwarves, I'm quite literal with anvils hitting, uh, I have hammers hitting anvils in the orchestra, sounding like pickaxes. Um, so that you feel like there's a, a musical culture for um, all of these races, all of these regions that is sewn into the score in such a way that you can't extricate the score from the music of the environment, which means I, I think uh, when characters start singing, such as um, at, at the, the boat at the end of 101 or Poppy singing mm -hmm. uh, This Wandering Day, it doesn't feel strange. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like musical theater. It just feels like Tolkien. Yeah, and I was very glad that they did include some singing from the characters within the show because again that feels like a key part of Tolkien that people sing and it is a key it's a cultural thing but it tends to be ancient cultures right your point that the dwarves carried instruments with them the older cultures everyone could make music in whatever way whether it was simply playing the spoons or getting out an accordion or whatever it might be a zither or um that making your own entertainment and making your music was a way of telling stories, it was a way of bonding, it was a way of celebrating, it was a way of mourning. And for me, Tolkien writing this into his books gives that ancient feel, that feel of ancient cultures, and, and your music very much is capturing ancient cultures. And I was glad that the showrunners mirrored that in having characters actually sing. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there it's hard to remember that before recorded music, which in the history of human culture is a blink of an eye. Right. Uh, music was carried on through oral tradition, through performance, and with it, um, poetry and stories. And that really was our culture. Like our culture wouldn't exist mm -hmm. without painting, writing, and and music. Yeah. Um, and and in, in particular, you know, melodies, there's a lot of components of music that stick with people. Um, melody to me is the most um, divine in a way. Hate to use that word, but it's true. There's something magical about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 um, I worked on a show and I still work on a show called Outlander for um, mm -hmm. stars, um, which takes place it, all throughout the last 300 years, but predominantly it, it, it begins in Scotland during the Jacobite yeah. uprising in 1745. And those folk tunes from that era were something that I loved when I was a kid, when I was growing up, especially in high school, I studied them. And, and indeed one of those melodies, the Sky Boat Song is the main title to Outlander. The reason I bring this up is that that melody has been time tested. Mm -hmm. That's not just a good melody because it's catchy, it's had 300 years, arguably more, no one knows where the melody came from, to prove that that hook is, is memorable. And people put different lyrics to it. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a text to it in the late 1800s that I used for Outlander, although I tweaked it as well. So now the Outlander version, we changed, yeah. uh, changed the gender from last to la uh, lad to last. My point being that I wanted to write melodies that felt like that. Mm -hmm. You can't write a melody and know that it'll last hundreds of years, but you can look at the melodies that have and break apart some of their intrinsic traits so that when you're writing um, an anthem for some of these places, in particular, the more mighty empires, 
you know, cause I do bum 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 bum. It's it's part art and part inspiration, but it's also part craft. Like I I think that that is built from ideas in other like anthems and marches that have last lasted. And my hope is that you feel when Elrond walks in and he sees this place, not that you're hearing an awesome cue from a show, but that you're being taken into a place that has existed for hundreds or thousands of years. And this is just what their melodies have become. Yes, you're hearing the, the music of those people. You're hearing their heartbeat, if you like, their musical heartbeat. Um, yeah. And I, I really enjoy what you do with rhythm as well as, as with melody. I feel like for Tolkien, rhythm is probably a, a big part of it. Obviously, he's writing poetry. His songs are poems, and there's a rhythm to them. And with his, the way that his... Um, passion was in alliterative verse you know anglo-saxon yeah. alliterative verse which is all about the rhythm and the pacing of the words um and i i love how your different motifs different themes different cultures have different rhythmic feels. rhythm is an is an incredibly useful tool and i just want to say when you hear a, an old recording of tolkien reading his text it actually has a very distinct feel his he he's a very exciting performer, I guess I want to say, but like you realize that like, yeah, there's a rhythm in his text that um, is, is hidden in there that he is able to bring out. For me, rhythm tells us about um, um, where people fit in society and, 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 and it sort of plays on this like basic idea. I'll give you a visual analogy that like our brains crave symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, so like, this is a pop culture reference, but like Two-Face from Batman's Rogues yep. Gallery is inherently a disturbing figure because half his face is looks different than the other. And people that are generally viewed to be beautiful, like they've done studies, it's like your brain likes yep. symmetry. So uh, symmetry has a lot of power, um, repeating patterns of, I mean, that's why pop music is like 99% in 4-4. Four, four. That's literally why. Yeah. Um, but then asymmetry is something that can be very beautiful, very powerful. Um, Sauron's theme is in seven, eight, not four, four, or eight beats. It's got seven. And then to mess with you even further, his melody then has passages that are in four. One, two, three, four. Da, 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 it tells you that he's shifty. He, when you when you hear his theme, the ground is uneven under your feet. Um, another one was the Harfoot themes. It, it's not to imply that asymmetry is evil. It can mean um, that life is difficult. Um, the Harfoot theme is in um, eleven. Um, bar five, bar six. Mm -hmm. And I just imagined their cartwheels rolling along, but one of them has a chip in it, ka-clunk. Uh, we're moving, ka-clunk. Because it's it's hard to move these giant carts, you know? That it, And that's part of their life, is that it's, in very clear ways, it's different than the hobbits of the Shire whose life is extremely comfortable, idyllic. Um, and um, so I wanted to show that in their theme, that there's this asymmetry. So the rhythm uh, rhythm is awesome. I, I mean, I just think it's a fantastic way to send information uh, in an emotional way that, um, that uh, otherwise you might not be able to. It was very interesting. When I was fortunate enough back at the end of April to be present at one of the recording sessions in London, um, which is where I first got to meet you. And it was just a thrill to sit and listen to those incredible instrumentalists and watch, I think it was Gavin who was conducting that session and just amazing work. And I was looking back through my notes um, and I had written down, and the notes were by the way, taken away from me by Amazon security. I was gonna say, I remember some I didn't know I wasn't allowed to make notes. No one had told me I couldn't. And, and they were like, oh, we need to take those notes. But they photocopied them and sent them back to me once I was allowed to. And I had written, hey. 
one of the things we were listening to, of course, I didn't know what it was, but I'd written down hmm, seven, eight against four. It's unsettling. So, really? yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, there in my notes. I was like, okay, he's making me feel unsettled here. Yeah, that, that uh, well, I love that that was, uh, I love that that was clear and unsettled, uneasy. That is exactly um, what I was going for, you know? And, and uh, so that was, planning out all the things that we're talking about was what those first four to six weeks were comprised of and, and why it was so difficult. Um, because I had to make sure that if I'm laying out these 15 ideas, each of which has an intro, A, B, outro form, that none of these ideas overlap. Yeah. So uh, that, that was, tricky because I've, I've, I've written myself into a corner in the past when I didn't, mm. um, when I wasn't careful and I would write a theme for a protagonist um, and the a theme for an antagonist. And I go, oh, great, there we go, let's move on. And then, it, you know, on a show, for example, when you don't, you can't go back and change episode one, I'm at the season finale. And then it turns out, oh, the, the protagonist does something bad. I'll set the protagonist theme in a slower minor key. Oh, that's so clever. But then I realize when you do that, it is the antagonist. <laughs> it is, oh, damn it. Then you're like, oh, no. You know, like you, when you, you have to be able to change yeah. things about the theme and have them still, the shape has to be the same. So, you know, that, um, that was tricky. That, I mean, it, to do that on two themes is, it requires thought, but to do it across 15, right. it was like, um, it was just like a, a puzzle. I would, I would sometimes write a theme over here and I go, oh, that's awesome. And then I would go, wait a minute, what was my Nori theme again that I wrote a week ago? And I listened to it, go, oh, it's the same idea. Like I can't, I gotta move things around. So yeah. it, was, it was, it was a lot that I, I'm not going to lie. That was a lot. I'm curious when you're creating, say a theme for, for Durin, for example, do you begin with the theme of the place from which he comes? So do you say, right, I need to know what Kaza Doom's theme is first, and then Durin's theme comes from that, or are they not related? I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, because you've, you've touched upon a really interesting point here, which is that the character themes need to relate to the anthems. Every, every race has an anthem. Um, Valinor for the elves, Kaza Doom. Uh, Numenor, uh, the Orcs, the Southlands, aka Halbrand, um, Harfoots. So every character theme needs to be related to that. Um, I'll tell you, so for example, I, I always started, I always start with emotion. And I don't remember if I wrote Prince Durin's theme or the Khazad Doom theme first. I think I wrote the Khazad Doom theme first because I I knew I had that one. Yeah. Um, but let me talk about Nori's theme. I wrote Nori's theme first. Da, 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 I was, I, I felt really good about that. Um, it was lyrical, it was modal. Um, and then I wrote at some point later, honestly, the Harfa theme was was tough. I did three or four drafts. My original ones were very expected, very Shire-esque, very um, British folk music inspired, which A, just sounded lame in that it's imitating something that is so great. Yeah. And B, it was comfortable. Yeah, it's Vaughan Williams. It's a cup of tea. Exactly. In, and in that the is, garden. And that, it was really the epiphany that, wow, it is pouring rain outside in Los Angeles, you guys. Oh, yeah? Oh, check this out. Oh my God. I was like, what is that sound? Look at this. Look at this. Wow. Moody. This is so rare. I love this. I, lo I grew up near Seattle. I love this. That's like your monsoon season. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Sorry. No, that's cool. Uh, yeah. It's the um, comfort uh, was, was wrong. So I wrote the, um, I wrote the Harfoot theme, which had that unevenness. Yeah. And it also had um, balafons, West African instruments called balafons that, uh, mm -hmm. that are marimba-like sounding, but they're a much cooler sound. But then I thought, well, how does this relate to Nori? Um, 
And then I went back and I thought, well, I can't make Nori's theme uneven because she is very aspirational. Um, but maybe I can throw in the wooden percussion. And then I wrote an ostinato for her, this opening thing, where you do hear the Harfoot color subtly, but it's definitively there. And uh, the Celtic instrumentation that is present in both ties them together. But that's my point is that it's not as simple as writing one and then writing the other. I had to write them in tandem yeah. uh, and, and go back and forth. Um, and, and dial in the ingredients so that they matched. Um, and, and I went through that process with everybody. And, 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 and so really that's why when I got hired on this thing, I met the showrunners and then I told them they weren't gonna hear from me for six weeks. And I, I wouldn't send them anything. I wouldn't play them anything. I was like, I can't even talk to you. So I just came into this space mm -hmm. and, um, and was in that process for hours a day yep. um and it was uh it was it was brutal to be honest it was it was it was incredibly exhausting and draining uh, much harder than scoring the show which itself was um i guess eight further months of working 12 wow. to 15 hours a day with like seven days off in in totality in there but the first four weeks were were, were worse because it's yeah. like that generative process of coming up with those themes is is um well it's what edison awesome. say 99 percent perspiration one percent inspiration you know yeah it's uh, it's, it's very true uh some of them came very easily the casa doom thing i feel like that's just in my dna you know i i like you're a, you're a dwarf at heart i think i am because i just thought like yeah like i understand this culture and how hard they work and how proud they are and like yep. they're tiny but mighty like i get it um and and even duran's theme uh was a delight because it's like jaunty and comedic um but also noble and you you hear it in, in the track which is actually very similar to the, to the scene in 102 when elrond meets Diza and then he looks at the tree the sap the, the seedling Mm -hmm. And you just hear immediately this noble French horn playing the exact same melody you heard a, a cello and a fiddle play a second ago. Um, so I had to make sure that melodies like that could work in both uh, contexts. And I love that about Duran's character. I love that the showrunners kept some of the lightness of touch, but didn't make the dwarves like comic relief that there is a, a deep nobility and i think owain arthur plays it beautifully and certainly i agree towards the end of the season it was his performance that moved me to tears his relationship Absolutely. with elrond and you know and if it hadn't been well played both in terms of his acting and in terms of what you were doing with it musically that could have been just cheesy and too much but it had this nobility at its core that really strengthened it there were several things that I wanted to do as a fan um, of the of the books and of the movies. Um, there were several things, you know, like I, I mean, you know, cards on the table, you know, like I, 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 I worshipped those Peter Jackson first three movies when they came out, and I watched the behind the scenes on them as often as the movies. And I thought like, these are my people. This is, right. I wanna work on something like this. Um, so, you know, with love, I say that over the course of six films, there were two things that began to occur that I thought our show might have a chance to readdress. One of which was the dwarves became increasingly comedic. Yep. Um, when you look at fellowship and 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 uh, Gimli is at the Balin's tomb and he falls on his knees, it's very moving. Yes, and he, he even in that trilogy has a few other moments, mm -hmm. but it really it's he doesn't get a moment like that again. Um, and and I, I agree with you. I think the dwarves are a, are a mighty race and a noble race. Um, and and the other thing was that the orcs got increasingly cartoonish and funny almost that that uh and i think you can see a, 
an effort. I, I'm now, I don't want to speak on behalf of any other filmmakers, but I think you can see in the second episode an effort from everyone involved in the Rings of Power with one orc in your house to make them really terrifying. Yeah. Again, and, and again, like, I've been showing all the original movies to um, the, the Peter Jackson movies to my eight-year-old daughter and the Urukai and Fellowship are not to be messed with. That oh. They are up there with the greatest of movie monsters. And when Aragorn takes out that last one, I mean, it's brutal. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I think that there's, that's there. Uh, and, and I don't know that, I mean, again, I, 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 I adore the films. I don't mean to criticize them, but I, but I, and I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying, yeah. Dwarves, noble, orcs, scary is good. And that's where we're at. Um, yeah. and, and the third thing that I actually said in my meeting with them is um, the reevaluation of Isildur, who I think, I love the, sim the simple cinematic arc that Peter Jackson created about the weakness of men, that there was this guy who was a symbol for the weakness of men that Aragorn could say, I'm afraid I'm going to be weak like that guy. And Arwen can say, no, you won't. And everybody goes, got it. Yep. But the cost of creating that was yep. to take a character and make him essentially almost a, not a villain, but a, 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 scapegoat. a scapegoat. Thank you. And so in my first meeting, I, I, I said like, I, I, I hope we're doing something interesting with this character. And, and I hope that, when our show ends, we might have um, a lot more feeling about this character. And, and, and I think the comp I used, which is the comp they were using, ironically, is, is um, Michael Corleone from The Godfather. You want, you know, at the end of The Godfather, I'll say two, but you could say three, two, whatever. But Godfather, you, 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 you understand why he did everything he did. You don't like that he killed his brother, but you know, he kind of had to. And the movie ends and you just feel like sad for him, but you went on a journey. You don't hate him. Right. So I thought, wow, like that, if, if for pop culture, Isildur can be maybe reevaluated through that lens, like how cool would that be? Right. And then fans that, you know, in a decade from now that don't know any of this stuff and just kind of decide to watch the Rings of Power and then watch the Peter Jackson movies, I think they might have a, a more nuanced experience. So just that, that thread, you know, I think it's, I think it's, it's so interesting because when you think about it, like the reverence that Aragorn has in fellowship in, in PJ's movie for the shards of Narsil, the sword that cut the ring from Sauron's hand. And there's this mural on the wall, which is Isilda confronting Sauron. And yet then Isilda just becomes the, yeah, but then he screwed up. And so he- Yeah, I'm afraid that it's like, I'm afraid I'm gonna be weak like him. It, it was a cinematic shorthand that was- And it totally was. But you're right, you're right that in the production design and in other aspects of the filmmaking, it was clear this was a reverential figure. Uh, a complex figure. Um, so, uh, you know, but, but, but uh, in the opening 10 minutes of Fellowship of the Ring, it is not possible to, to put that much information in and it's not needed for the, in, for the story that you're about to watch. Um, so I, as a fan, I mean, the minute the show was announced and it was clear as in the second age, these are things I'm already thinking, like, wouldn't it be cool if we start to tie these things together and is there a way to take that opening prologue which of course is told through Gladriel's POV which yeah. I love um yeah. is there a way to like, to blow that out into a huge you know 40 or 50 hour story which it deserves you know and and whether or not it matches up with every version of the lore that we have all created in our minds because every single one of us has a different version of it, uh, it still creates an emotional truth yep. in picture, in in motion, in cinema, television, that is really exciting and powerful. And and I just love the idea that we might be able to tell a story that nuanced, and then people can go back and watch the Peter Jackson movies again. Or let's face it, many of them will watch them for the first time. 
yeah. um, rediscovering them because of the Rings of Power. And I think, and, and then obviously all these roads lead back to the books, which is, I think, the, 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 the most exciting part about it. Yeah, totally. It seems like hearing you talk about it and, and, and in other interviews that I've seen that you've done, your passion for exploring these stories in a new way is very, very similar to what I've heard um, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay talk about. And so it seems like it was a real meeting of minds for you guys. Did that make the work easier? Tremendously so. Not only did it make it easier, it, it truly made it possible. Um, I uh, did not send them my themes. They never heard them. I didn't say, here's the Gladriel theme. What do you think? The first time they heard the track called Galadriel is when you heard it, when it was released. Um, instead, I just worked the theme into a cue mm -hmm. and sent them the scene. And um, I trusted their instincts. Um, and uh, they would immediately say, oh, wow, is that Galadriel's theme? That, da, 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 da. That's really pretty. I also knew when I showed them uh, Elrond's first scene in 101, which had this big theme in it. And they went, is, uh, is there an Elrond theme in there? Does he have a theme? And I was like, no. <laughs> well, I was, I, I, I said, I literally said, guys, we're going to stop. I, I want to stop even talking about it. Because if you don't hear the theme, right. me describing it to you isn't going to help. Let me just go write a new one. And I did. But after, and I, 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 after two episodes, uh, th 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 there's a standard procedure in scoring anything, television, film, games, whatever, um, called spotting. Spotting sessions are where you look at the spots where the music occurs and you talk about what it's going to do. You do it in advance of writing mm -hmm. to, to make sure that you're on the same page. Yep. Then you do cue reviews where the composer writes the music, sends it back, and then you, you go over it. Um, and each of these takes hours and hours and hours because sure. we're just talking about stuff. After episode two, we didn't spot the show anymore. Like, we didn't even talk about it. We spotted parts of the finale because I said, let's, I wanted to make certain I understood the shifts in that episode. Right. But otherwise, like, I just, I proposed to them, like, that it was a waste of time because all I said during the spotting session, we'd look at each scene and I would say, I think I know exactly what you're going for. It's this. And they go, yeah. And then I'd say, uh, you know what I want to do is this. And they'd go, that sounds great. And after two hours, it's like, why are we even doing this? Yeah. Um, but that, that is rare and it is very rare. Um, and, and, it, and, and even on cue reviews, they, they ended up being with rare exceptions by, by, by an email. I would send an episode and they would have 48 hours because of the schedule to give notes. And they'd write them back and they were always insightful, great notes. Um, they're very tuned into music and theme. Um, an example of a kind of note they would give. They would say, um, well, when these two characters are talking, I can hear this theme and, and that theme, but you know, aren't they really talking about some subtextual idea? Wouldn't it be cool if we heard that theme instead? Mm. And I thought, wow, you're right. I, I missed the forest or the trees. I'm playing the surface. Their notes you know, made me a better writer maybe a more sophisticated writer. So that was great. We just kind of got into that sync. Um, <clears throat> and the they best, were incredible. It's the best artistic relationship, right? Absolutely. Where you're, you're on the same wavelength and you just make each other better. Yeah, and that really was, that really was the case. And, and, and uh, you know, I would raise questions about the storytelling and, and sometimes comments on, picture editing and sound and, you know, all of us in post, not just me and uh, the showrunners, but the sound designers, editors, VFX people, we would have these frequent get togethers where we would look at the current mix of an episode often without the showrunners. And all of us would just give our notes. Yeah. Um, meaning that for the first time in my career, the first time that my bosses heard the final mix of an episode, I had already given a serious round of notes, hours worth of discussion, raising music <clears throat> or compromising with the sound design team. If we really thought this has to be sound design, I worked with them on how to pull the music back, what layers to pull back. It was very much a mix 
that was like the composer's right. dream mix. Then the showrunners heard it. That's why I think it sounds so good is that we, we as a sort of post-production family went through that and had to hash it out together before showrunners come in. Because once showrunners come in, their, their time is so precious they're, they're not going to spend eight hours going over a mix. Right. They're, and they're going to listen for just the most important um, big picture details. Yeah. And that, that to me is one of the greatest luxuries of, um, of the budget that we had to work with. Because all that that requires is time. Yes. And time is expensive. A dub yeah. stage is expensive. Um, when I started my career on Battlestar Galactica, we had four days on a dub stage for each episode. Four, wait. Was it only two? It might have only been two. Wow. But uh, two days for an hour. And for an hour of Lord of the Rings, <clears throat> I would guess they had a month or maybe yeah. more. Um, so there you go. That, that's, that's how that experience is crafted. But it's also, it's very nice to hear that um, to everyone that I've had the great pleasure and privilege to talk to involved with the show, whether it be producers, um, you know, John Howe doing concept art, Lee McPherson doing dialect work, you with the music, the actors, etc. There's a real um, fellowship, you know, to, to use that phrase amongst the, the team. It's very clear that this has been a labor of, of love. And I, you know, it's refreshing to hear that every time and be reminded of that because so much people sort of go, oh, it, it's it's Amazon, and therefore it's some evil empire, and therefore it's some churned out, mass produced cash cow. But every single person who was involved gives the lie to that assumption because there's such passion and camaraderie and meeting of minds. And you know. yeah, that I I I anticipated that, and I understand that uh, this is a oh. thing that is being made by one of the biggest companies in the history of human evolution right to get it um me too one exactly w one thing that has always struck me though is like i don't know maybe i'm cynical because i'm in the industry uh if you wanted to do a cash grab you'd do it very differently and mm -hmm. i am certain you i i am certain they heard the cash grab pitch from other showrunners the the sexy young Aragorn Chronicles practically writes itself. Yep. Um, you know, you could do the gardening show with Samwise. I mean, like th there are so many ways that this could be spun out in the sort of cinematic universe approach where you just throw paint at the wall. Um, the second age on a huge budget. That's a, t <laughs> that is, I would not call that a cash grab. I think, I think uh, for people like us that are like, that love the books and the lore and we're familiar with the story, you think, oh yeah, that's the obvious thing to do. But like, you got to zoom out to think about what most people know. That is not the obvious thing to do. And furthermore, even if it were, my experience was like everybody else's. I spoke to or met or had any interaction with anyone from Amazon for the first time when I was done writing the score. Mm. The only thing that they did for me was coordinate marketing. And for me going to Comic-Con, for me going to London, press, and they, they're amazing. But like, I didn't get notes from them. I didn't even hear that they had notes. Uh, meaning that like, they heard the mixes from the JD and Patrick and, and Lindsay Weber sent over and, and they said, you got it, keep doing what you're doing. So to me, Amazon got the right people and gave them the resources that were needed and then walked away. You know, that that's incredible. And even from my recollections of the appendice behind the scenes stories from Peter Jackson's um, experience and mm -hmm. other stories that have come out since the horrific lawsuits, Harvey Weinstein. Look, his movies were not made in an environment like this. Right, that right. fellowship emerged, but I mean like just to get those movies off the ground, uh, it sounds like it was a nightmare. 
And my guess is that Peter and the writers had to deal with that. And, and if, if JD and Patrick were dealing with, with notes from the studio, I, I, that, that would have affected me. I, I don't, they sheltered me from it. Right. And I don't think they were. I think, I think the studio uh, trusted them. So that's incredible. That, that to me is like, whatever you feel about uh, Amazon as a company, you, you got to give it up that they're the only company that could afford to do that. Right. Right. It's true. I want to ask you about a couple of the, the themes. I'm particularly interested in what you do with the different elven themes, because one of the things that the showrunners have talked about quite a lot in some of the um, press events and things that I've been to is the fact that the second age is a time when we're seeing um, empires, if you like, or at least peoples that by the third age are either completely gone in the case of Numenor or are fading. And it's, you know, th there's a sadness, there's a decline in the third age. Um, but Tolkien talks about a sense, a, a weird relationship that the elves have with, with mortality, with the gift of men, um, and with the sense of the things in Middle Earth that fade, and the ones who chose to stay and not go to Valinor are living in a world which does decay, and they have to deal with that. And for me, your elven themes all have a, a sort of longing to them, particularly the Valinor theme is very sort of haunting and has a, a yearning um, for something beautiful that, that is maybe lost. I don't know if I'm reading too much into that, but I wanted to ask you about that. Um, great question. Longing is definitely something that I wanted to infuse into the themes that I wrote for elves, but it's different than the third age elves. Their longing is much more present and um, unavoidable. Mm -hmm. um, Valinor was introduced in the first episode and, and sort of bookended the episode with the sequence on the boat. So I knew the Valinor theme um, had to be, had, had a lot of things to accomplish. And to add one more degree of difficulty, I also wanted it to be the piece of music that was sung on camera by mm. the elves in the boat. They had already shot that scene when they hired me. So okay. So make of that what you will. You're going to be singing on the boat. Yeah, that uh, I also had to write a theme that would match mouth movements that were already shot. Oh, okay. So I worked with the picture editors. That scene took a month. Now, there was a beautiful, beautiful piece of music there uh, written by Plan 9. That all, uh, they wrote um, This Wandering Day with JD. They wrote some, some other songs. Uh, it was great. But it wasn't a theme. Yep. That was the only thing that I, I, it, it, and of course, why would it be? That wasn't. They weren't assigned to write a theme. They were assigned sure. to write a piece that was being sung. So, but the reason I thought that it had to be the Valinor theme was sort of for what you're implying. Like this is going to be a theme that sticks around for the show for the long run. It is for the purposes of the Rings of Power, the show. Valinor is the elves' theme. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so there's a longing there. There's a, there's a, a wistfulness and an eeriness. Uh, some of the, some of the chords in there, one in particular, that's just like a tritone away from the tonic, which is as far away as the chord can possibly be. Um, it, it feels like it's, it's out of reach, you know, it's, you're reaching for it. Um, and, and Elrond has longing too. His theme is wistful and uh, sort of inherently optimistic and sad. It, not to get too technical, but it, it pivots around between a major and minor tonic. Is it in a, it starts off in a major key for sure, but then by the end of the first phrase, it's in a minor of that same key, which is weird. That is not a, that is not a thing that happens in popular melodies. Um, and that's because he's an orphan and he's, he's, living in the shadow of his, of his brother and his father, wow. um, both of whom are, who alluded to, and, and, and to me, some of the most emotional moments in the first season 
is are him in conversation about his father. And you hear that little solo clarinet come in with his melody. It has that longing that I think is part Elvin, but also, you know, in Elrond's case, of one that's very specific to him. Did you did that translate for you? Totally. It's one of the things about Elrond's character that never really gets discussed anywhere. Tolkien doesn't particularly address it. Or, you know, when he and his brother had to make the choice, do you go with the world of men or the world of elves? And they chose to go in opposite directions. That was a permanent parting. Huge, yeah. And at this point, Elros has been dead for a long time. You know, yeah. and, and, and we never get to understand really how that feels to be a character who is immortal and yet some of the most important people in your life have died and died a long time ago. I, you know, it, th there must be some permanent sorrow. Absolutely. And, and I love that we meet him in a state where he's, maybe Robert would have a different way of looking at this, but you know, the way I interpret his character is that he's almost forcing himself to be optimistic. He's just optimistic. And that's why in his scene with Durin, when Durin's mad at his father, he can walk up and basically say, you think you've got it bad, you know, but, but he's, he's at peace and he's, but, but there is this loss there. And, and I think that, you know, you look at how these characters, well, at least three characters begin and then how we meet them in the third age. Elrond is a really interesting one because he's, um, especially as portrayed in what people know from the Jackson films, this authority figure. Um, and, 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 and very stern and very um, commanding. Um, and, and when you watch those films, you know, out of context, you know, his motivating force in the second and third one, especially is just, I don't want Arwen to die. I don't want Arwen to die. She's my daughter and she should come with me. But it's like, there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. he's, he's lost all these other people yeah. that, that it's in his family. And this irony that like, you know, loss to elves doesn't necessarily mean one in totality. And he's lost people permanently. Yeah. You know, so I, I think that learning how he got to that point is something that I'm really interested in. And in fact, I, I got to say, there's no theme I struggled with more than the Elrond theme. That was the theme that I had to throw out because the guys, JD and Patrick, didn't hear it. And I think I was really... I had to purge from my mind all memories of the Jackson films. This is where they were not helping me, where that elven sound and it's like Hugo weaving and the gravitas and the weight and this guy's so badass. And it's like when we meet Elrond and he's like writing a poem or something out in the orchard, you know, it's like, it's not the guy. He's not there yet. Yeah. Um, and I really, that one, I that's one where my, my, love of those Peter Jackson films actually hindered my progress momentarily because I, I really had to um, separate and know that I'm going to build up to that. My plan is, you know, by the end of the show, uh, you're going to hear variations of the Elrond theme that will hand off to, to the Elrond that we meet in the third age in a, in a pretty easy way. But I think, or, and I think that Elrond that we eventually get to has to come from a place of optimism and strength and hope because he still seems to be there for me in, in Peter Jackson's movies, that he's still willing to try. He's willing to help. He's, you know, he's got yes. his reservations about getting involved with men and dwarves and again, but he's willing to try. He's willing to call the council. He's not shut the doors and, and shut himself off, unlike some of the elves. Absolutely. And, and he's an interesting contrast in, in Rings of Power with Galadriel because they both, obviously she's a lot older than he is, but they both have known great heartache and the loss of everything that they once knew and this sort of uncertain future. 
and he chooses to approach it as you're saying in a very different way from the way yeah. he is currently choosing to approach it I, I i i agree and i think that the one of the joys of drama is change um fundamentally drama without change isn't drama you're you're staring at a picture right uh so for me um the way these characters um uh and a few others enter the rings of power it, it to me it's such an exciting um it's such an exciting contrast with what we see in the peter jackson films and that you're gonna you're gonna get to watch um this this slow evolution and i believe that given that time that narrative time a believable evolution um that uh that's going to be layered and 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 complex and and exciting you know and i think that it's going to be so rewarding um should we get to you know get to the end of this knock on wood we're going to get to the end of this and 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 get to sort of narratively hand the baton over to the movies and all the pieces are in place. Uh, I just think that's gonna be incredibly uh, rewarding. Yeah, satisfying for sure. Um, I have to say your Galadriel theme is my favorite. It's the oh, wow. one that I get stuck going round and round and round in my head. It's so beautiful. For me, it, it actually, in the same way that, that what everyone calls the Star Wars theme was actually originally written as Luke's theme, of course. For me, Galadriel's theme, no disrespect to Howard Shaw's beautiful theme music for the show, which I love, but for me, Galadriel's theme is the theme of Rings of Power to me, and it I, sort of encapsulates the emotional core of the show to me. I, I, I definitely feel like uh, 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 the, the, it's a call to arms, that it's like, it is the theme that, uh, that when you sort of rise up out of your chair and 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 pick up your sword to go do something heroic totally. that that is the one and yeah and and absolutely uh you know i i i love howard's theme uh, for our show oh, and to me it's um it's like a prologue it's like an overture that that plays before uh, a, a um an opera almost it like to me it just takes us back to those fond memories of the of the Peter Jackson films and reminds us of just all those beautiful colors and chords yeah. and and it's almost like this this beautiful um on track you know uh and and uh yeah to me you know Galadriel's theme she's our POV character for a lot of the action and I mean ultimately she is our POV character like she's the one that is giving voiceover narration and she's the one that gives voiceover narration in the opening of Peter Jackson's films. Like I, I think the structure is 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 fairly clear that she's the POV character. So that yeah. Galadriel theme, I really wanted it to be something um, melodic and and hooky and and um, and and emotional and powerful. So I, it means a lot to me that you uh, that you like it. And uh, it. anyone that doesn't like it is is if anyone who doesn't like it is. Maybe you're gonna have trouble sitting through Rings of Power because you hear it a lot. <laughs> I am well, I am not yeah. subtle about it, and so sorry, but I, I really, I really like it, and I find it just really effective it, it, when she um, has big moments when she gets on the boat in the ending of Episode Five to go, you know, in Numenor, and she's got the armor on for the first time. Man, that's just really cool. Yeah, it's it's a theme that I found myself singing in panels that I've been on it because it's just like and then it does this you know and it, it yeah it gets you um i want yeah. to talk to you about numenor's theme and and specifically my question is really to do with the use of of brass because i know that that's not kind of the foundation of the numenorian theme but it it is where to me it's where it most echoes the clear ringing of silver trumpets in in gondor and yeah. i wonder mm -hmm. what it is about um the world of men. I'm hesitant. I don't know if you know this, but there used to be a drinking game back in the day with with uh, Peter Jackson's movies, and one of them was anytime anyone said the world of men, you took a drink. <laughs> so, so I feel I'm using this phrase here. But anyway, um, what is it about the world of men that gives them this pomp that is worthy of brass fanfares? That is a great question because something does. 
something does, Kirsten, and I'm not sure what it is. Um, it's, you know, when when everyone was speculating at the clips that we'd seen and we're like, oh, what city is this? What what you know, one of the things when we first saw a glimpse of what turned out to be Numenor, I remember somebody in the chat saying it can't be elven because the elves don't build statues like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah, this kind of glorifying of your past and this pomp and circumstance is a very human thing it's a world of men thing not not an elves not a, i mean the dwarves have their their own of course pride but yeah you know what's interesting as much as i've thought about <clears throat> my creative process i haven't ever questioned this but here's my process on numenor i knew that i wanted to reference middle eastern harmonic changes uh middle eastern and mediterranean percussion i wanted to sort of evoke an ancient culture I wanted, because, because Numenor to the Third Age events, the end of the Third Age, mm -hmm. is as ancient to them as ancient Egypt is to us. Right. So automatically the idea, some people were like, oh, are you going to quote the Gondor theme because blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it's thousands of years earlier. That's right. like saying that when you're walking around New York City, you hear music from ancient Egypt. It I wanted distance. And, and so to me, um, we don't know what music in Mesopotamia, ancient Greece, mm -hmm. Babylon sounded like. We know there was music. We know there was instruments. We even know what some of the instruments were. We just don't know what it sounded like. But we have enough of a sense. And popular culture definitely has a sense of what those colors are that I wanted to use those and tell viewers that we're going into an ancient superpower. Now, with that said, never did I ever question that there would be huge brass chorales doubling this melody, which also has duduk, solo cello, and yaili tambor, Turkish instrument, big bowed string instrument. But I, I knew immediately we're also going to have the French horns, and I even wrote it in a very specific key. It's got a wide range. Da 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 da. That um octave leap on the duduk is tricky. Um, so I wrote it in exactly the right key that the duduk could do it, the tambour could do it, and the French horns, it's a sweet spot for them. And why that is, is what you're getting at. And I think the other thing is, the other thing that I was referencing in addition to those ancient cultures is Camelot. I wanted it to feel like Camelot. Yeah. I wanted it to have an Arthurian quality, which is everything you're saying. The world of men, the pomp and circumstance, the lost kingdom, like all of it. And what does Arthurian music sound like to popular culture? It's very, very brassy. I mean, I think about Jerry Goldsmith's score to First Night. Oh, what a great score. Um, but anyway, it's funny because to me, it's almost like so obvious you would do that, that I've never even spoken about it. You're the first person to even ask because like, of course, I'm going to have the French horns going up to high C on the new one or theme like it didn't even occur to me that it would never that it wouldn't be that. I don't know. It's interesting. I wonder if it's to do with certainly within Tolkien's uh, cultures that men are the most impermanent creatures. Um, and and so they're I don't know, maybe we're, we're find, trying to find ways to hang on. If you're an elf and you live forever, you don't need to have no, fun it, fans, it's maybe. true. Oh, and, you know what I mean? And there is a pomp and circumstance to the world of men that is very true. And again, going back to world musical history, I mean, the duduk, tambora, traditional instruments, um, voice is one of the, is the oldest instrument. Percussion is the second oldest. And I'm using a lot of traditional Middle Eastern frame drums. Um, but brass doing... I mean, the original brass instruments didn't have keys. Right. So, ba, 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 ba. Like, these are, these are part of fanfare. Da, 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 da. Yeah. For a reason. Like, there's an acoustic reason that yeah. fanfares are, use these pitches is because originally they didn't have keys to play chromatic notes. Now I fudge it, of course, because I love chromaticism. Da, 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 da. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, whatever. But you know what I mean? That like that brass 
evoke early kingdoms. Yes, it's a cliche in popular culture, but it's based on some history that there's truth to that. It's, it's, and there's a sort of heroism about it as well. Something heroic, I think, in the, as, as I say, again, the clear ringing of silver trumpets. We have that line in, in PJ's movies, in yes. Tolkien, you know. And I'll also, I'll go one step further both with Casa Doom, which also includes brass, albeit very low brass, doubling these men. There's power here. These are mighty cultures that, uh, yes, they're noble, and yes, they're good right now, but you want this sense that, like, you know, if that might were to be put in another direction, you could have serious problems. Right, don't mess you know, with these people. Don't mess with these people, exactly. But like it, um, and, and this is a level of nuance and complexity that this story allows that there was not as much space for in the cinematic adaptations of The Lord of the Rings. Sure. Obviously it was there. When we get to Gondor, Denethor is not, He's a he's not a good leader, and 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 uh, Minas Tirith is not doing what it should. Right. But it's not really a, ever considered that like he would Denethor would turn the armies against our heroes. Like it it never it, he was an ineffectual leader and a coward. But there was never the sense that like the might of Minas Tirith could be turned, and he would join Sauron or or whatever. That was there was just not that wasn't in the books as I recall. And it just wasn't, um, there wasn't room in it. But this is really, a, you know, I think Numenor is a really interesting long saga that, that, um, that people are gonna be able to have very complicated feelings about. I want you to, I want people that don't know the source material to just fall in love with this place, you know? And those divisions, the King's Men versus the Faithful, um, we haven't really seen, I'm trying to think, we haven't really seen a divided society in, in that way with people who are supposed to all be on the same side. No, we only, see the, we only see the aftermath of societies that had divided. Uh, I mean, actually in almost every race, we see that in some form in, in, in the various movies. Right. Um, and to see that kind of civil war unfold, as it were. I know, and it's funny because I, you know, I, you know, the show took a lot of heat, uh, and and some of it was like the the depiction of that divided society, you know, felt like it was on the nose for modern politics, and it's like that is not art imitating life. That is life imitating art. Um, right. Something that has happened over and over and over again. Um, and I really appreciated seeing that, that side of it, you know, and that the division in Numenor is, is what the story's about. That's what the second age tale of Numenor is about, yeah. right? I mean, this, this society comes together in a, in a beautiful way and, and it, it's fractured and, and that leads to what it leads to. So uh, I, I think that it's like, anyone uncomfortable with that story, like maybe this isn't the show for you, man. Like this, that's that's what this is about. Well, and um, it's not like it's a superimposed story. That's the story that Tolkien had in his histories. And exactly, and, and he was a lover of history because that's what happens over and over yep. throughout history. So we are living in history now uh, and we are making art based on art that was inspired by history. Um, yep. So I'm, you know, I'm really excited about that. And I thought about all this during, you hear it in my score. You hear it, the might of Numenor when we come in. But um, when Cayman says to his dad, Farazan, how come you're going along with this? And like, you're just letting the elf take charge or whatever. And he shoots in this glare and the, you know, it's a great scene where the little cafe suddenly empties out and, he's, and his son is like, uh-oh. And basically Farazan puts his cards on the table. And it's very clear he's, He's an opportunist and a populist, and, and um, he's very much in control of his decisions. The Numenor theme plays again, but it's not like you heard in the beginning right. of episode three. There's a different side of it. There's, 
it's the same shape. It's in a minor key. Um, but it's it's telling you that like there's an there's an underbelly to this place that that, that I, I think that as the show goes on, the faithful theme and, and the Kingsman, it's it's just going to be the Numenor theme. There's not an overarching Numenor that encapsulates these two themes because Numenor itself is split down the middle. Right. So ultimately, Numenor's melody, which starts off so beautiful, you know, like you and is is going to be the one that maybe presents some problems for our heroes. And you hear the, the, the faithful theme that starts off with Isildur on the boat with a rustic fiddle. And then you hear a brass instrument do it for Elendil when the white leaves fall. That's the theme. It's not the theme for the, a theme for Valinor, for the Valar. It's not the theme for Numenor. It's, it's a theme that you thought was associated with just Elendil and his kid. You realize, I hope, I hope you realized that it's like, oh no, that theme is the, it is the faithful and it's going to branch off and become something really, really significant. That's exciting. When, when do you have to start back to Middle Earth? When does the work begin again? It's already begun. That's exciting. Yeah. Are there any themes that we haven't heard yet? Are you anticipating somewhere down the line having any new themes? Yes. That's also exciting. <laughs> it is very, I am very excited. I have to ask you, and I don't, not, I'm not trying to get spoilers because I know you won't give me any, but I, I often think of um, Alan Rickman in the Harry Potter movies and how J.K. Rowling told him, spoiler alert, that Snape had always been in love with Lily, right? And he knew that and nobody else knew that before the last book came out, nobody else knew. Um, how much do you know of where the story is going? You said earlier, we were chatting before, you said that you liked to be surprised where it was possible and not know everything that was coming. But how much of the big picture, the kind of overall arc of it, do you already know? I know most of the big picture as it exists now. So uh, usually the surprises for me come when I read the scripts. So I I do read all the scripts. I I have... I've read the second season um, and that does, it's great. It helps me and it's necessary for me to do my job. Sure. Um, but it does also deprive me a little bit of that experience that, that you have. By the time I'm watching an episode, I, am, I know exactly what's gonna happen and I'm already looking at the details. So in a way, I don't know, I, I'm torn. Like when I was working on Battlestar, I, I made a point to never read the scripts. I, I didn't want to know because I wanted to see a cut and I had to know, I had to feel what the audience felt yes. so that I could you know, understand it. But, but the only difference is like in Battlestar Galactica, they were planning it a season at a time. I couldn't have asked Ron Moore, the showrunner in season two, what's going to happen at the end of season four? He'd be like, I don't know what's happening at the end of season two. Right. So I, I felt somewhat secure just saying, let me see the episodes and let's figure it out. This is really different. Obviously, it's really different. And, and it's one of the great things about the show that we, we all know where it's going. So that isn't the question. The only question is, how are we getting there? And um, I will say that uh, I think season two is really good. I think people are going to like it. That's very fun. I hope we get it sooner rather than later. I think everyone's going to be like, what? Come on, come on. You know? Whenever we get it, it'll be worth it. I'll say that. And um, so, so you, you've already started thinking, writing, working, playing. Um, your, your intention is to be in this for the long haul, right? You're going to be in for all, all the seasons to come. That is my intention. Uh, I don't take anything for granted. And, and uh, every time they re-up my contract, I'm like, I say thank you. So if they will have me, I'm here for the long run. That's I, yeah. I'm I'm excited. As we've seen the whole of season one now, and we've all been able to go back and binge watch the whole thing in one go if we want to, and explore it more and tear it apart for good and ill, as everyone's doing on the internet. I wondered before we finish today, Bear, if you could share maybe one Easter egg that you that a lot of people may have already seen but they may not have seen just one thing to say to people go back to this episode and look for 
this little moment, some little thing that you hid in there that that people can go back and look for now that the show there are a lot of Easter eggs. I remember uh, when episode um, four was it four when uh, Galadriel touches the Palantir and then Queen Muriel takes her up there and and Wayne, the director, he's like, oh, that's Narsal back there that she walks by. I've seen this scene a hundred times. I worked on it for a day, you know, and I was like, what? There it is. It's just, and I'm looking at it like, oh my God, of course. Yep. Um, I mean, there, there's so many, there's so many Easter eggs. Um, Any musical moments in particular you would say, go back and listen to? Yeah. I mean, on the, on the off chance, well, yeah, on the off chance anyone's watching that hasn't watched all the way to the end yet, I won't, I won't spoil any big ones. But I will say that um, one thing to know is that the, the text in the choir in every scene was crafted for that scene and is commenting on that scene in a language that's appropriate for the point of view character in that scene. Uh, and that's a lot. There's a lot of that. Um, and so that's one thing you can like rest assured that even of course on the big moments, yes. But even on the small moments, there's text you can barely hear that there was, um, you know, thought, a lot of thought put into it um, about making sure that that, um, you know, that that the the language is being represented um, properly. The other thing that that I that I think is fun is to just look at the Sauron theme and the places that it occurs, how often it occurs, and um, the thing about it is that. Um, all our heroic themes have these big upward, well, not all of them upward, most of them are, leaps. Da, 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 da. You just, you do this mm -hmm. when you listen to it. Sauron's theme um, is circular. It's ring-shaped. It, dun, 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 dun. It, you, 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 you go around in circles. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. And I wanted it to feel round. And it is one of the only themes in the show that has that shape. I, that, I, I reserved that tight contained um, contour for him. And in many ways, like, I think that that's, that adds cool foreshadow. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the score is painting a ring for you long before anyone mentions the word ring. Um, and um, the other thing to listen for is the, um, at the end of the show, we hear Fiona Apple sing uh, um, Where the Shadows Lie, a song that I wrote based on the ring verse. And you, you actually hear this the entire show. It's almost in every episode. Over the main title of the first episode, you hear these two chords that are from what I what are ultimately my rings theme, the rings of power theme, is this melody, and you hear it again when we meet Celebrimbor. That's weird. You hear it again when the dwarves look in a a chest and something's glowing. That's mm -hmm. weird. You hear it again when they start talking about mithril, and then you go, okay, it's it's the mithril theme. You just keep hearing it again and again, and it and and it keeps evolving until you finally and you hear it in the end credits of 101, like the whole end credits. You hear this weird melody that so obviously I think has lyrics, and you hear it throughout the score. Bum, 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 bum. Three rings for the Elven Kings. It's that to me is almost like the 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 most fun little Easter egg, because as it evolves, um, it, it really becomes clear what it is. And there's another one, but I don't want to spoil it just yet. I'm not ready to talk about it, but it's, <laughs> it's in there. Well, when, when you want to share, give us a call. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Bear, thank you so much for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. And I know that the One Ring.net's fellow fans out there will be thrilled to hear what you have to say. And I wish you luck with the you know, mammoth task ahead, but it's it's really, um, I know it's rewarding from what you've told us, and it's certainly rewarding for us all to get to hear the end result. So 
Well, thank you for the kind words and uh, and for listening and for watching and for truly for keeping the flame alive um, and 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 helping people discover this incredible body of work. Um, so it's it's an honor to chat with all of you guys.